Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers consensual searches, possession of cash, and civil forfeiture, and is brought to us by Real World Police's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On January 27, 2021, Uber driver Osama Aburas, an employee of c to r Wholesale, was traveling from California to Tennessee when he was stopped by the Texas Department of Public Safety, or DPS, for allegedly following the vehicle in front of him too closely. During that traffic stop, DPS discovered that Mr. Aburas was traveling with $96,690 in cash in the vehicle. DPS detained Mr. Aburas while its criminal investigations division contacted an employee of First Horizon Bank in Memphis, Tennessee. The bank confirmed that c to r had an appointment scheduled and that the business had frequently conducted large cash transactions throughout their long-term relationship. After concluding its investigation, DPS allowed Mr. Aburas to continue his trip. The next day, January 28, 2021, Arkansas State Trooper Joshua Elmore stopped Mr. Aburas for, once again, allegedly following the vehicle in front of him too closely. Mr. Aburas pulled over, and Trooper Elmore approached the vehicle. Hey, Trooper Elmore, State Police, you're just falling too close. I'm sorry, man. You're falling too close to that car. Uh, I can't, but I was gonna try to bash it. I wasn't too close, I was No, you're too close to it, man. Too close. Do you have a license with you? Yep. I was too close. I like your car. Sorrento car, thank you. Oh, okay, okay. Do you have the rental agreement with you? That's in my phone. Okay. You coming from Kansas City? No, I'm coming from California, sir. Oh man, that's a long way. Yes, sir. Hey, you have any weapons on you? No. You mind hopping out for me real quick? Sure. window I'll talk to you over here okay what do you do for work besides deliver cars uh, I do when I'm in town I do Uber plus I work for company transportation company yeah deliver car call a shortage now sir do you have anything illegal in that car no no drugs no guns something like that <laughs> no like that would you have any problem with me searching the car no you're okay with me searching it yeah okay Trooper Elmore requests permission to search the vehicle, and Mr. Aburas consents. As we've discussed many times on ATA, police officers can always perform consensual searches of an individual's vehicle, home, or personal property, regardless of whether they have a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. In these situations, citizens have the right to refuse to consent to the search, and they should always exercise that right, even if they know they're not involved in criminal activity and think they have nothing to hide. Here, Mr. Aburas likely thought that there would not be any consequences consequences for allowing Trooper Elmore to search the vehicle because he had been investigated and cleared by the Texas DPS the day prior. However, because every department has its own policies and statutory authority, despite the fact that the Texas DPS concluded the cash was legitimate, the Arkansas State Police still retained the ability to conduct their own investigation. This is one of the many reasons that individuals should almost always refuse consent when officers request permission to conduct a search. Okay, uh, well here's what we'll do. Uh, do you have the keys on you or are they in the car? It's in the car. In the car? Okay, what well, I'll have you do is I'll have you uh, walk about 30 feet in front of the car and stand in the grass. If you need me, just holler for me, okay? All right, do me a favor, just walk right up there. You'll be all right. Why do you have a large amount of cash, sir? After briefly searching Mr. Aburas's vehicle, the trooper locates a backpack filled with plastic baggies containing $96,690 in cash. Possessing large sums of cash is not illegal. However, officers are trained to view large quantities of cash as a sign of potential drug trafficking. And when combined with other evidence, the possession of cash can serve as reasonable suspicion for an investigation, or even probable cause for an arrest. For instance, in the 1989 case of United States v. Sokolo, the Supreme Court held that the possession of cash, when considered with other factors, was sufficient to support reasonable suspicion. The court explained that, quote, paying $2,100 in cash for two airplane tickets is out of the ordinary, and it is even more out of the ordinary to pay that sum from a roll of $20 bills containing nearly twice that amount of cash. Most business travelers, we feel confident, purchase airline tickets by credit card or check so as to have a record for tax or business purposes, and few vacationers carry with them thousands of dollars in $20 
$20 bills. The court also determined that it was reasonable to believe that the individual was traveling under an alias, and that his travel plans of flying from Honolulu to Miami only to stay for 48 hours were unusual. The court then concluded that, quote, any of these factors is not by itself proof of any illegal conduct, and is quite consistent with innocent travel, but we think taken together, they amount to reasonable suspicion. Similarly, in the 2003 case of Maryland v. Pringle, the Supreme Court rejected the Court of Appeals of Maryland's holding that $763 in cash found in the glove compartment of a vehicle where cocaine was found in the back seat was not a factor in a probable cause determination because, quote, money without more is innocuous. The court concluded that Maryland's consideration of the money in isolation, rather than as a factor in the totality of the circumstances, was mistaken. Therefore, while possession of cash on its own is not sufficient to establish reasonable suspicion or probable cause, it can be considered as a factor as part of the totality of the circumstances. I can't explain that. I have a receipt. I'm going to the bank. I got stopped in Texas. I have that thing. And they checked me out. Everything is good. How, how much is it? It's about close to 100. 100,000? And I have the number you can call in Texas. They check me out for two, three hours, and they let me go. I'm picking up from one company delivering to the bank. I have the receipt, I have the paper, I have everything. I have the number from Texas. I mean, Where's I, your receipt and stuff at? In, in the car. Can I show you? You say that receipt's in this bag, sir? It's in the folder? Yeah. It's in the folder. Right folder. Okay. This is the bank I'm going to. I have an appointment this yeah. morning, but I'm late because I stopped yesterday. Yeah. And this is the company's paper. This is the receipt where I picked them from. And this is the company that I'm delivering the money to. I want to see all this. Operation one. papers. Yeah, they're done. And this is the receipt where I'm going to with it. I hope you don't take offense to this. It's just, it's just very unusual. You know what I mean? Very unusual, but. Yeah, I'm not saying it's illegal, I'm saying it's very unusual. After reviewing the documentation Mr. Abudas provides, Trooper Elmore explains that such large cash transactions are unusual, but that they're not necessarily illegal. However, the fact that Mr. Abudas was not arrested for a crime did not deter the troopers from seizing the money and initiating a process known as civil forfeiture. Civil forfeiture occurs when the government seizes property, money, or other assets because it suspects it was involved in illegal activity. On March 18th, 2019, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson signed into law the Civil Asset Forfeiture Reform Act of 2019, which amended Section 5-64-505 of the Arkansas Code to state that, quote, there shall be no civil judgment and no property shall be forfeited unless the person from whom the property is seized is convicted of a felony offense that related to the property. However, despite the intent of the legislature, Arkansas law enforcement agencies still have the ability to transfer seized property to the federal government to conduct civil forfeiture proceedings under federal law. According to Section 881 of Title 21 of the U.S. Code, all money furnished or intended to be furnished by any person in exchange for a controlled substance, all proceeds traceable to such an exchange, and all money used or intended to be used to facilitate a drug violation, quote, shall be subject to forfeiture to the United States, and no property right shall exist in them. Section 983 of Title 18 of the U.S. Code explains that, quote, in suit or action brought under any civil forfeiture statute for the civil forfeiture of any property, the burden of proof is on the government to establish by a preponderance of the evidence that the property is subject to forfeiture. It's important to note that this standard of proof is a civil standard that essentially means more likely than not, which is a far lower burden than the criminal standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. If the federal government is successful in its forfeiture case, Section 881 of Title 21 of the U.S. Code also allows the Attorney General to transfer any funds that are forfeited, quote, to any state or local law enforcement agency which participated directly in the seizure or forfeiture of the property. In transferring funds back, the Attorney General must, quote, assure that any property transferred to a state or local law enforcement agency has a value that bears a reasonable relationship to the degree of direct participation of the state or local agency in the law enforcement effort resulting in the forfeiture. Here, because the Arkansas State Police was the only law enforcement agency involved in seizing the money, they would likely receive a substantial portion of any forfeited funds funds, even though they would not have been able to receive anything under Arkansas state forfeiture law. Your money? No, I'm just delivering it. I wish to deliver it. <laughs> I don't know 
Hey, let me make some phone calls. I'll try to get you out as fast as I can, okay? I'll call them too. Yeah, I'll call if them. If you call them, you save yourself some time, and you save me time. I swear to God, this is legit. Okay. Hey, this is Trooper Elmore out in Arkansas. I have a uh, car stop that one of your troopers stopped, uh, let's see, yesterday? What did it say? 27? 28. 28. It Trooper Elmore returns to his patrol car and attempts to call the Texas DPS to confirm Mr. Abudas' story, but he's unable to reach anyone who can confirm the previous investigation. The trooper then makes several other calls to various higher officials, including the DEA and the local prosecutor. In between the calls, Trooper Elmore tells the other trooper on the scene that he does not believe that Mr. Abudas is committing any crimes. I'm going to call this number of building lighting. Four and four. We think on it. DPS let go. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Good sign. We should let go. We all we both know it's weed money. Yeah. Believe me, I, I'm trying to save you because I don't want to deal with this as much as you don't want to deal with this. I appreciate that. I will appreciate I really, that. Because this is one. Save you time and save me time, and I'll, I'll make the bank today. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate if you, you know. Let me, uh, but just give me, we're working as fast as we can, okay? Okay. Just give me a Thank second. You. I appreciate that. I don't know. I really don't think he's done anything wrong, though. I think, I think that's why he's so adamant that he's good to go. Is he, he hasn't done anything wrong. Yeah. I don't think it's him so much as a company. While Mr. Aburas was not arrested and was eventually allowed to leave, the troopers seized all of the money. On March 2, 2021, a complaint for forfeiture of the funds was filed in the Circuit Court of Crawford County. But on July 13, 2021, the case was transferred to federal court. On August 2, 2021, the federal government filed a complaint for forfeiture under federal law. The complaint alleged that Trooper Elmore's canine partner indicated that traces of drugs were present at the rear passenger side fender of the vehicle, and that several swab samples taken from the seized cash tested positive for the presence of cocaine. On October 26, 2021, a settlement was reached, with the government agreeing to return $38,676 of the seized funds, while the remaining $58,014 would be forfeited. As the settlement agreement required each party to pay their own legal fees, it is likely that at least a substantial portion of the returned money will go towards attorney fees, leaving C to R Wholesale with little or none of their original sum. Overall, Trooper Elmore gets a B, because although he was within his authority to stop Mr. Aburas and seize the cash he was transporting, he did so with very little evidence to suggest that the money was involved in illegal activity, and a considerable amount of evidence to suggest that it was not. Nothing that Trooper Elmore did during this encounter was outside the bounds of his authority, however. That may be the most disturbing aspect of this interaction. It's difficult to fault members of law enforcement for taking advantage of government-sponsored programs that encourage departments to engage in civil asset forfeiture and offers financial incentives for seizing large amounts of cash. Police departments all across the country have routinely employed the use of federally sponsored programs to seize large sums of cash that would eventually be returned to the department and added to their budget. In fact, according to a 2008 investigative series on National Public Radio, some Texas sheriff's departments rely on forfeited money for up to one-third of their budgets. These investigations also found some highly irregular spending from departments who use these programs, such as a $90,000 Dodge Viper for the county's D.A.R.E. program in Camden County, Georgia, and $20,000 for TV commercials for the district attorney's re-election campaign in Webb County, Texas to name a few. There are a litany of implications associated with civil asset forfeiture, and the topic has been hotly debated by legal scholars and civil rights activists for years. There are no doubt some positive aspects to the concept of asset forfeiture, especially in a climate where police officers are expected to be highly trained and efficient, but departments are facing the serious prospect of being defunded to some degree. However, Mr. Aburas, along with many other Americans, had money taken from him without being charged with a crime, and was unnecessarily subjected to the muddy and often unproductive legal battle. This interaction highlights how civil asset forfeiture can influence a department's protocol and encourage officers to make unnecessary seizures. If you have an opinion regarding civil asset forfeiture, regardless of what it may be, I encourage you to contact your congressional representatives and let your voice be heard.
As for Mr. Aburas, it would not be appropriate to assign a grade to an individual who was largely out of control of the situation and who was never charged with a crime. As mentioned in many episodes of ATA, it is almost never a good idea to grant consent to police officers to search anything, regardless of whether or not you're guilty of a crime. And as demonstrated in this interaction, you do not necessarily need to be engaged in criminal activity for a police encounter to have negative results. If Mr. Aburas had refused to allow Trooper Elmore to search his vehicle, then this entire interaction may have been avoided. Outside of granting consent to search, Mr. Aburas remained calm and collected throughout the encounter and made a legitimate effort to prove to the troopers that the cash was legal. I commend Mr. Aburas for maintaining his composure, and I commend C to R Wholesale for following up this interaction with the proper legal action. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.